welcome to everybody for joining uh, joining me here in, in Carrie's Photography Schoolhouse. I'm, I'm very excited to be back and, and thrilled to be sharing just, uh, I guess, a little bit of opinion with you and, and some technique. And uh, as hopefully you'll see, and I'll go into full screen mode here, um, I want to help you raise your personal bar in photography. Uh, my heart really is in photography. Aside from, as Carrie's mentioned, I've had a a love affair for 35 years working in photography and my passion is photography as well so it, it kind of works out very nicely uh, that I'm continually working and, and just growing and I love teaching. Uh, I just got back from completing a, a month-long uh, assignment teaching at Brooks Institute of Professional Photography which is uh, just a, a giant thrill and I had some wonderful students and you know, it, it just every time I do something new, and I, I do a lot of seminars and workshops, but this is a little bit different for me teaching in, in the university type situation. And boy, did I grow and I learned from these these wonderful students that I had. So uh, I want to bring that to you. I want to share with you a few different things. And part of what I want to share is just my appreciation and involvement with Canon. Uh, Carrie mentioned I'm one of their explorers of light. And, and that just is a, a wonderful position because the only thing that Canon really wants from us is that we share our passion with you. And I certainly hope that I can get you excited about seeing some things a little differently. So what I'd like to start with is, is really talking about my ultimate passion in photography, which is, which is light and, and how light just makes a photograph sing. Uh, you know, you can put someone in the same place just an hour apart and it either sings and jumps off the page or just falls into mundane and it, it kind of reminds me of uh, hiking in Death Valley you know with with the career that I'm blessed to have that I, I photograph people for a living be it portraits and weddings you know commercial assignments uh, and I, I kind of relax by going out into nature and just enjoying its beauty and capturing those those either special moments or creating them or just exploring until we see something that's that's kind of new to us. And one of the things I learned most about hiking in an area like Death Valley is, you know, watching either a sunrise or being out there for sunset. And as the sun kind of pops over the horizon, it takes this big empty sand dune field. And what I mean by empty is you can hardly see any differentiation from dune to dune before the sun comes up. And as soon as that sun does come up and pops up, all of a sudden there are beautiful lines, sensuous S-curves, all this depth and dimension. And if you're lucky to be there long enough through the day and you're there for sunset, you just watch it fade away and suddenly it becomes just blank again. The canvas is kind of erased. And it, it, it's intriguing to me, and I, I want to share that to, with you and, and kind of get you going and raise the bar because what I feel of, of raising the bar of professional photography really especially today with so many new folks in our industry comes down to some of the old standards and I want to kind of explore them with you and I've got illustrations to kind of help pump you up a little bit that you'll get out there and pay a little bit more attention to light and composition and and all these different things that go into making a very strong photograph so I've, I've got this beautiful bride here and I hope that you can see in front of you just the, the lovely light on her face, just highlighting her face and edge lighting her dress and her body, just making her jump out of this photograph. So they're so dimensional. So th there are so many tools that we have in, in, in exploring light. I tend to use my hand. I'm left-handed and I walk around and I had my students at Brooks this past week following me around doing the same thing, seeing how light illuminates my hand so I don't have to worry about having someone stand in front of me. But what it does show me is that direction of light. And in as much as I, I think the industry of photography today, and especially people photography, like the portrait and wedding industry, it's going through a remarkable change with so many people joining, so many people giving up their careers, so many people getting cameras because the technology of the cameras is so far advanced now it makes picture taking almost, almost brainless. And I know that's a very strong word, but what goes on there, you're able to press a button, you're able to get a focused, ex well-exposed image. 
And from there, we have to just tune it by making sure that the light works, the composition works, and we put in all those elements that make strong photographs. So I want to I want to play with you with that. I want to explain that. I want to discuss a few things because it seems that a lot of people that are entering our industry today are doing so because they've just gotten a new camera. A few people have mentioned that, boy, you take some lovely photographs, you should be in business. And before they know it, they're in business, but without the real credentials. And those credentials are a little bit of knowledge and education. And that's why when Kerry invited me back here, I was so happy to work with him those couple of times in the past. You know, He's got everyone's best interest in mind, and I love what he does for everyone, so I was very happy to join back in. And just switching to this photograph of, of this model, it, it just exemplifies what I'm able to play with and what a good time. And, and realistically, she's standing in the dark. And I've got two flashes. I've got a flash immediately to my left in about a four foot by four foot softbox, creating that beautiful pattern of light on her face. And as you'll see how the photograph goes from highlight to shadow, We've got detail all the way through there, and then as it starts to get into some darker shadow, I went and put a kicker light or another softbox, or in this case, it wasn't even a softbox. It was a strobe through a little grid that would just narrow down the angle of light so that I could open up that shadow side and create some depth and dimension by having light from different dimensions. So it really does come through that it, I've said this for many years, it's all about the light. Um, in this case, I think uh, a couple of things need to be discussed. And, and what I enjoy working with is some sort of light modifier. And what that means, the strobes and the flash units that are being put out today, I mean, they're beautiful, wonderful units. But man, they're small. And small light equals hard light. And hard light really isn't complementary. So as convenient as it is to just carry maybe a, a Canon 580 EX2 strobe, uh, we need a little bit more than that. And I, I tend to travel with a 5-in-1, which is a reflector that in the center has a translucent diffuser. I travel with soft boxes. I travel with scrims, 4-foot square and 6-foot square, big panels of fabric, so that when I put my flash behind it, it creates what you'll see on her left cheek, uh, just a beautiful soft light pattern. And it goes from highlight to shadow very gently. And to me, that's just the mark of a, a beautifully defined and carved image. And no matter where you go within this image here, you can look at her right hand. It's high on her cheek, and it's got detail in it. And that detail goes all across her face, uh, transforming those beautiful eyes and going into shadow. And you'll see, you can see pores. You can see, look at the detail on the back of her left hand, the lower hand. So we're just carving, and, and that's... What's really important is, is, I think, carving with light, not just simply placing a flash on top of your camera and throwing light blanketly everywhere, but kind of honing it and fine-tuning it a little bit. This next image I just put up, you'll see uh, Anna, my model here, a very similar light pattern. Uh, and instead of working with the, instead of working with my kicker, uh, illuminating her cheek, I just used it as an edge light to separate that black leather jacket and her dark hair, but keep that attention driven to her face, which is in this case illuminated, illuminated by a four foot by four foot scrim. Uh, so I'm, I'm working with things that I'm always going to diffuse my flash. And the bottom line is our job as photographers, and especially people photographers, is to make our subject look good. You know, with getting down and playing with funky angles and tilting the camera and working later in post-production with a lot of effects, a lot of overlays or textures or anything like that, that's all wonderful and, and that's personal style. And I, I implore you to, to remain that way, using it as personal style but not as a crutch. So my, my heart here is, is really screaming out to share with you about Again, raising the bar of your, your quality that you're producing and turning out some uh, the highest quality work that you can, which, again, isn't really necessarily convenient. We're going to work with a few extra tools or carry an extra bag that we might not want to carry, but the results certainly make it worthwhile. You know, I, I moved outside with Anna here, and as you'll recognize by the flare coming over her shoulder, 
uh, I photographed this image in Arizona. It was only 111 degrees here. And you'll see a similarity to that first image that I showed you, where now in this case I worked outside with a little larger scrim. This is a six foot by six foot scrim. And I love a large light source. And there's a couple of uh, portrait ideas that have been around for the ages. And, and those two thoughts are the larger the light source, the softer the light. And the closer the light source, again, the softer the light. So what I'm always looking for is soft light. Now that really is a complementary light. And we, of course, we want to make her skin look as good as possible. And even though I've got flare raking across her body, I'm shooting straight into a, boy, a, a hot sun here. You'll see that there's light coming in two dimensions and two directions. And if you look at that main light, which is illuminating the mask or the plate of her face, you can look at her skin and see just how soft it is. And I haven't done anything to retouch it here. I think a really important element is doing as much in the camera as you can. We're going to save that time in front of the computer to be creative, but I implore you to do just that, not rely on correcting every single facet that you can think of in photography that you can cover it in Photoshop or whatever tool you're using. But we have a lot of strength, and that is you know, within our knowledge and capturing it correctly in the first place. So here again, I worked with those two lights so that I could help carve her face and, and that line coming from behind her, that kicker light just accentuates those beautiful high cheekbones that she has. So I'm trying to create soft, beautiful light on the face and then open the shadows up with that second flash. And I, I put this together, and most of what I want to talk to you about today is, is the portrait wedding market or photographing people. Uh, anything I'm sharing with you today, it doesn't necessarily have to only uh, uh, link together with a white dress and a, a bouquet like we see here. But since that's what maybe a lot of my people are doing and a lot of the people that I teach are portrait wedding photographers, I've thought to construct this webinar and keep the, the subject matter with just that. But please, be, be open-minded and understand that the light technique that I'm sharing with you here it works that if someone's in a, a white dress or a, a business suit or anything else, it's still photographing people. Well, the image that you're looking at, in case you, you were with me in the earlier presentations in April and May, uh, what I've done here, you might have seen these images, but what I've done here, this is a, a very similar type lighting situation where Photographing this bride, we've got the light coming from camera left, and you'll see a kicker coming from camera right. Uh, we don't always have to have big lights, big expensive lights, or lighting equipment at all. As you'll see by this, uh, I walked out of the dressing room when this girl was into her dress, and we were going to continue with the rest of uh, the wedding portraits that we were doing. And as I walked out, there was this blinding direct sun coming into the... Uh, into the room. So as I walked out the doorway, the first thing I saw was this bright sun, and I thought, how wonderful. You know, if you'll see the size of it on the left side of your screen, you'll recognize it's, it's three or four foot wide, and all it's doing is illuminating her just like a softbox, and it's nothing more than the sun itself bouncing off a wall that was covered with very light uh, wallpaper. So light happens in many ways. We don't always necessarily have to be you know, setting up our pro photo light or a Canon uh, speed light, but it can be almost any light source at all. Uh, I've been working with some powerful uh, deer guns, as I call them, you know, something that I find at Lowe's or Home Depot, which are big tungsten lights, and they work the same way. Uh, raw, they're very, very um, challenging to work with. But as soon as I drop it behind a, a diffusion panel, it illuminates things just as magnificently as a, a two or three thousand dollar flash. So it's not the equipment, but it's certainly the person who is uh, working with the equipment and figuring out what to do with it. So when we go out and we photograph people, uh, I'm continually looking for a couple of elements to be present. Uh, one of those elements that you may recognize here is isolation. And what I've done with this model is I I pulled her forward, I'm going to think, 50, 60 feet away from those trees. And I'm shooting this at 200 millimeter on my Canon 1D Mark IV. And it's a, a 70 to 200 millimeter image stabilized L lens. And what you'll recognize is that it's 
she's standing in, in direct sun, and I've just turned her back to the sun, so we're using that uh, rear illumination as a hair light, and that light is also making those trees and leaves behind her really dimensional and, and sort of backlit. And from the front, I just had my assistant hold a, a reflector, in this case a five-in-one reflector, and I think I was using the silver side of it to kick back some directional, dimensional light. So again, we don't really need to have lighting equipment in order to do that, but certainly some other tools or light modifiers. And there are so many companies that make uh, these five-in-one reflectors. I, I implore you to go down to your local camera store and talk to them about it. You'll, you'll find them that you can add them to your arsenal for somewhere between $50 and $100. But what we're getting here is, is light that is coming from an angle. And I think that's something you're going to see kind of consistent through my work that I'm going to present and uh, share with you tonight. That light comes from one side or the other, and that creates a shadow. And I want to see some shadow. I want to fill in shadows if they're too deep. But if there's no light whatsoever or no shadows, if the light is, is pretty well flat, I really think it's important to add light and, and dimensionalize it, if, uh, if you would in that it's coming from one side or the other. And I tend to have the person, my subject here, turn her nose into the light. So this way the light is coming at her and then falling off on her cheek, and I tend to shoot into the shadow side of her face. You'll see that consistent again through various images. In this case, again, just kind of trying to share some little ideas that sometimes making, uh, that makes photographing people rather easy. I'm photographing this young man. Uh, it's kind of in a chilly Wisconsin area, and I've got him out there, and we've got beautiful soft light on his face, and this beautiful light behind him of all those trees being illuminated. But those trees are actually about three or so stops brighter than he is. And rather than put him standing in the direct sun, I thought to just kind of lean him against this window, as you'll see, in the window reflecting what's across the way from us. As we stand in shade, it's, he's being illuminated by that big open sky and all the uh, light bouncing off the leaves. So it produces a very easy work environment here. If you can, uh, I guess, look into some, some windows and put these windows into your pocket for one of those days where it's just not working. You don't have a flash. You don't have a way of raising the light level that if someone's standing in very harsh, direct sun, we have to do a few things to make it easy for them and complementary. In, in most cases, I just, I, I always feel like I'm a vampire. I want to stay out of the sun. And I, I, not so much myself, but I do that for my clients because I want their skin to look good. I want their eyes to be wide open. And here you can see that. He's got a beautiful soft quality on his skin. He's looking right at me. Those eyes are, are nice and wide, and he's not uncomfortable. And a lot of times, if you put someone standing in the direct sun and think, well, I'll just fill it in with a reflector and you kick some more light in there, uh, they can barely keep their eyes open. Or some other people have the idea, well, well, I can just fill it in with flash. And if you do tend to fill in with flash while someone's standing in the, uh, the bright sun, the thing that a fill-in flash won't do is minimize any squinting. So in keeping with just kind of discussing these technical elements, one of the common denominators here is, is seriously to keep your comfortable your client as comfortable as possible. They'll be most cooperative. They'll give you more time to work and it's it's a pleasing relationship instead of one where they're really not going to work work with you again or they want to be done quickly because we're creating it just a discomfort. So I hope this makes sense. And I wanted to segue that into just some ideas of the I uh, looking around, actually using your environment. And my passion is, is landscape photography. And we're going to discuss that. Carrie's going to uh, share with you something toward the end of the broadcast. I have another webinar coming up for you in a few weeks, and that's going to be on landscape photography. But I, I'm just mentioning it lightly here because the next few images that you're going to see, what how I tend to make images really look outstanding is simply to find an outstanding background. You know, if you stand someone in front of a, a blank wall, there aren't too many things that we can do pose-wise to really make them uh, unique and to present a, a wide variety of photographs. You know, the light would be sort of similar, but the background just falls into 
into mundane. And the, the students that I teach, I, I try to wake them up to the idea of find a magnificent background, which is a magnificent landscape, and put them in the photograph. Incorporate that landscape into the photograph, and you've got an outstanding visual element. So with this beautiful S-curve, uh, I'm standing three stories up, and this is a little bit of a hike and a little bit of a challenge to do, but uh, there's a lot of times where we want to get out and scout locations to find something different because as we're working with our clients, it's not that easy to step away and, and go looking and hunting, but we often have to have a little game plan. So I, I found this area. It's, uh, I'm shooting this with a 70 to 200 millimeter on my Canon, in this case, 1D Mark III, and I converted it to black and white because it was just so geometric. I, I just so loved the shapes, and it happened to be taken in the rain. So weather isn't always cooperative. Light isn't always cooperative, but certainly what is are beautiful, strong, leading lines. And you'll see here, where they may not be leading, they're certainly symmetrical and repeating. So a lot of times, a very simple pose in a very soft lit area that's uh, very uniquely composed like this beautiful area in the Milwaukee Art Museum. So I, I really want you to open your eyes and start to log in backgrounds and start to look for shapes and areas. You know, I, I enjoy this photograph so there's, there's really only two tones in it, maybe three tones in the background. But what I see are a whole lot of triangles. So with that, I, I wanted to use it. It just attracted me to, to walk in and use this, and those soft, beautiful colors just complement uh, the gentle skin tones of uh, this beautiful model that I was able to work with. And I was moving her around. You know, if I, I do a couple of photographs in an area, and I want to change things dramatically. I want to look and move and, and create a variety of images. And often I'm looking for elements to balance. Like you'll see this little palm tree growing out of this pot. It was just a nice balance for her sitting up in this cove. And again, I just introduced one more color to add just a little bit of interest. But her face looking into it, it just kind of ties it all together and creates a little diagonal uh, composition. We're here, I've, I've got a groom up in the Santa Barbara area, and I'm, I'm using the, uh, the wrought iron here, those repeating circles and those beautiful palm fronds to just lead and, and bring your attention to him in a very kind of simple, subtle study of this man just before he got married. You know, looking for elements, and that's what I tend to do. I tend to hunt those down, like in this case, working with a long lens again for compression and isolation. You'll see that the background is, is way out of focus, and I have this bride and groom just on each side of the cross here. And it just makes such a beautiful statement. So, I kind of look at this as a, a new uh, American Gothic, and there's, there's so much of art that we're influenced by, but really as we keep things clean, we keep things simple, you know, even though they're a small part of the frame here, they're in soft light, and because of the isolation of that long lens, your attention goes to them immediately, and that's certainly our job as photographers is to direct the viewer, and we can do that without talking, or we have to do without talking. A beautiful study here on the steps of St. Mary's uh, Basilica in Phoenix, just a moment before the bride goes in. And, you know, here I couldn't move the sun. It's noon, it's overhead sun, just a very hard time to work. So what I tend to do is just lift her face up to the sun. You know, in this case, just a contemplative moment before she went in and photographed this with an infrared converted 5D from Canon. Uh, and just giving it a, a unique presentation of just a teeny little bit of Dutch tilt, uh, cinemagraphic term, which is generally a 5 or a 10 degree, well, well, let's say 10 to 12 degree tilt. And I know a lot of folks today have picked up on tilting the camera and unfortunately gone excessively in my, in my opinion. And uh, I find it hard to look at a photograph that's tilted to 45 degrees because I just don't know if it's vertical or horizontal and it always feels like it's falling over. And, and these are all just my personal little insights. We all have taste. We all have our own style. But I just want to share with you those thoughts because I, I think things that catch on aren't always the best. You know, they, they might have gone just a little too far. And uh, I, just like, uh, I just like sharing those thoughts with you. You know, we're always looking for props. What I'm looking for very often, soft light, as we have here. Nice prop of this, this wrought iron, beautiful wrought iron uh, gate. 
And I've just got her leaning in there. It's some strong eye contact. The background is obliterated because I'm photographing this at, uh, in this case, I believe it was 300 millimeter on my 28 to 300 millimeter Canon lens, of which if you're a Canon shooter, you have to look into that lens. You can imagine 28 to 300 without having to change the lens on your body. It's just spectacular. But through these things, as you'll start to see the shapes present, uh, a wedding that I photographed just a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas, shooting into a mirror on the wall as this girl dressed in the Bellagio. You know, seeing layers of people attend to her, she's totally backlit, a rather challenging photograph. But to me it worked nicely, you know, a frame inside a frame. And it helps draw the attention to what I really want to show, and even with the girl ironing in the foreground. You know, it just helps with the illusion of depth. So we, we can look around us. I, I very often, as I'm photographing, if I'm looking at something, I tend to look 180 degrees to see if there's anything else there that I'd rather use that could be dressing it up and making the, the presentation a little bit more unique. And along with that, along with looking for different shapes and different patterns, I'm often employing, employing different lenses. So a wedding I, I photographed not too long ago up in Seattle, I photographed this with a 300 millimeter 2.8 lens and beautiful colors compressing the idea of bringing the city of Seattle closer to this country club that we were at. And then when I think of the next photograph that I want to do, I, I surely don't want to just repeat this and do a wide variety, all looking the same, that gives the client one image to select from. I'm trying to change it drastically. In this case, moving on to the hill with them with a 24 millimeter lens, you know, enjoying those white wispy clouds up in the sky and it shows an infrared presentation, but if you can imagine these on facing pages, it just it really holds the viewer's attention and adds that that diversity. And you know, when you look through either your own work or some of your peers' work, as you're looking through wedding albums or, or images on a wall or sometimes sequences, what you really want to do if and it's it's something you do kind of uh, subconsciously you stay just enjoying and looking and your head bobs from one side to the other and it leads you to back to the same page. So we're kind of subliminally controlling the viewer. And that diversity, I think, is what's going to uh, bring more clients to you. They're going to see that you're, you're working hard and you're presenting a nice storyline. Speaking of storylines, one of the uh, early images that uh, I won, uh, I think it was my first award for, uh, bride and groom, way back in the early 70s, you know, left the church on a motorcycle, and I asked if they'd ride in front of the church so I could make it a little bit more storytelling and just panned as they went by. And I got this put together with an image of that same couple from Seattle that as they were rehearsing their, their first dance uh, the night prior to the wedding in their garage, uh, I just slowed the shutter down and started playing with a little bit of motion. I love the idea of being able to photograph motion or instill it because so many photographs are so static. But, you know, I want to play and I want to get to use, as I've mentioned, the landscape and the environment. And I've got this one in here for a few different thoughts. You know, they're just outside of their reception. This is going to be one of the closing images. Uh, I, I wanted to incorporate those beautiful clouds again. And what you'll see commonly with my work is that if there are clouds in the sky, it's probably going to be an infrared image. But I've got, I'm sure to here to have her face turned into the sun. I want the sun to illuminate her face, her body, and just bring it into easy, uh, an easy tonal range that I don't have to go through any um, repairing in Photoshop. So everything is, I'm kind of shooting into the shadow side. I'm shooting into the shadow side of the building. You see there's a highlight and shadow there. So it just really helps with depth and dimension. And sometimes to help force that issue, this bride just very comfortably leaning on a picket fence. And I've got my lens, in this case, again, my 70 to 200 millimeter image stabilized Canon 2.8 lens. And I've snuck it right up to some leaves. So I'm shooting through these leaves, which are very gently vignetting the image and kind of adding a color vignette to it. So I'll do that periodically. I stick my lens right into some flowers or leaves to help create a little bit more dimension. Uh, Something, if, if any of you have studied with me in the past, you'll, you'll know that I'm going to be talking about foreground, middle ground, and background. And very often only one of those elements are in focus. But I, I still want to go back to the idea, you know, I love weather. And when it's not good weather, I go out photographing. And 
here Johnny and Gagana were kind enough to play with me at the beach doing their engagement session. And there were a couple of things going on here. It's a miserable day. The, the June gloom of San Diego was certainly present. And, you know, that forced me to look at this as a black and white photograph to have that neat tonality in the sky. And I've got Johnny turned just a little bit more, and, and in this case his fiance standing in front of him, just blocking him a little bit, taking off a little bit of his body size. He's a little bigger boy than she is. And, you know, our job, again, as, as photographers and portrait photographers is to make sure that we make our clients look good. So sometimes a little twist or a little moving someone in front can take off some body weight. So I, I find that really important, as well as uh, even contradicting myself. I, I very rarely walk into a, a suite or a bride's home and shoot directly into the windows. Kind of the first thing I tend to do is walk in, open the shades or the blinds or anything, allow as much light coming in as possible, and then stay on that window side. Well, with that said, we still want to break our own rules. We still want to do something a little bit different, like with our mom helping her dress here. Uh, I wanted to shoot that silhouette and just make it kind of graphic, and, and I just continually just walk around people, looking at different angles, you know, watching her uh, lace up her daughter's dress here through her arm, and you know, the bride's arm is just resting comfortably on her waist, and it provided me a nice frame to look through. And in this case, what provided a frame for me, because I really do enjoy framing and forcing that issue of perspective by placing something out of focus in the foreground, in this case, it's the bride. I'm just tucked right into her veil, using her veil, shooting through it, and allowing me to see just a very small portion as she kind of tunes herself up in the mirror that's actually in focus and has tone. So I've taken, in this case, what was a, a very heavy room, a very dark room. Uh, this is with a high ISO. I believe I was in the, I don't know, 3200 range for this image. And I'm wearing, this is captured on a Canon 1D Mark IV. And if you haven't played with this camera yet, you really have to see how magnificent the noise is or the, the lack of noise is. So I'm working in ISOs generally from 3200, 6400, up to 10,000 ISO. But what it did here is just change the whole character into a high-key photograph. And I stay walking and playing with people to see how this is a kind of nervous moment for her and her little reaction of looking at me in the mirror, but I'm looking in the door of the mirror. Uh, the mirror of the door, forgive me. Uh, again, looking away from her. But, you know, she caught me kind of uh, keeping my eye on her that way and, and reacted to it. So it's, again, not always just staying, staring at your client, but looking into a, a different dimension. As, uh, as she approached her fiancé or soon-to-be husband here, we just made a, made a quick couple of images as she's leaving the security of her bridesmaids walking through the halls of the beautiful Bellagio Hotel in Vegas up to her fiancé, where, boy, I, I've been doing this now, uh, this shot, which I call a first glance, and it's something I, I think that I, I help bring to most people's attention probably, well, I'm going to say, it's got to be 15 years ago. And forgive my little, uh, that little hesitation there of counting the years, but I, I love this. It's my favorite part of the day as she walks up to him, taps him on his shoulder. He's been facing the other day, the other way, anticipating her uh, coming up to him and just grabbing his attention. And you know, he's been dying to see her. And as you can see by his expression, he's just he's thrilled. And it's such a powerful moment. So I really enjoy this. And I know a lot of people have picked up on this. And unfortunately, a lot of the examples that I've seen through the different teaching that I've done you're on the wrong side. You know, people are in front of the groom, so as he turns away, that magnificent expression of his is hidden, and you will see a lot of photographers shooting into the bride's face. And that's not the message of this photograph. So I hope this makes sense to you that this is the killer shot. This is, this is what we get paid for, to bring home that moment where he's just ecstatic over seeing her. But it really is getting in close. And I, I do see a lot of, of my peers photographing this in full body, full length. And I'm thinking, what do the feet add here? What do the surroundings add other than actually taking away? So I want to isolate him. I want to go in tight on his face like I've done here. I've got some color and depth and dimension. He's 25, 30 feet from a, a sort of fireplace in the background that has some beautiful flowers up on top. She's my foreground, so if you'll kind of remind, remember that, that 
mo uh, thought that I shared with you a few minutes ago, foreground, middle ground, background. He's the one, he's the one thing sharp, and you have no way, uh, hesitation in finding him. You know, this, this couple met, as you may hopefully do with your clients, so I want to find out how they meet. And they met in a cigar bar. And to me, or they'd ask, you know, could we do a few pictures with cigars? And I thought, absolutely. You know, and, and get to play with things a little bit. Took them out in the lobby. I added some flash here. So there's flash illuminating them, but my shutter was long enough so that I could pick up all the dimension in the hallway here. And, you know, working with a really casual kind of funky pose, it's a different kind of picture. It's a nice statement of who they are. But ultimately, what's going on that I enjoy is that you can see clearly into the background. But there is a lot of depth and dimension. It's not just dark background. So the light isn't coming straight at them. It's coming from camera right. So I've got highlight and shadow side, which helps it look very, very soft. We've got a very soft shadow. You can see under their hands or under Johnny's arm. And so it's very complementary light, and it's all held together by balancing with the background. So even in the reception, here's a 200 and so, about a 200 person party. And I've got two flashes bounced off a wall so that it can evenly illuminate the room. And as they're, they're dancing, as you'll see here, I'm, I've got my camera angle low, shooting under some people as they're moving through a circle and sort of some ethnic dancing. But I've, I've framed them. I've, I've isolated the bride and groom. You can see people even in the back of the room that are just well lit. And I've got nothing on my camera other than a pocket wizard radio control to fire the flash. So if I'm working in a huge room, I've got very soft dimensional light. If I'm working intimately with a model, I've got very soft dimensional light. And you'll start to see here the common denominator. Again, having no flash on the camera, it's nice to be able to move and really not be seen, not be recognized. And you'll see the light. You'll see the timing here. I think timing is everything. They're reacting to the best man's toast. And look at the best man's face, that little triangle of light. You can see my engagement photograph in the back. You can see some, some detail through the back behind the bride and groom. You can see some ripples in the drapes. And this is just from two flashes in a big room. But I will, I'll sometimes work without flash at all. In this case, I've propped myself down behind the bride and groom, their best man and maid of honor, proposing toasts all the way across the dance floor. And I, in this case, chose to use that 70 to 200 millimeter lens to compress. And then when the bride and groom finally leaned into each other to toast themselves, they framed this. You know, they framed the best man and maid of honor rather than just standing in front of an empty bandstand, you know, taking a snapshot of somebody. I thought that added a lot more character and dimension. What I want to walk through, I just got to shoot these yesterday, and uh, I want to share these with you. Just for some very simple thoughts and ideas that light is important. I shot this, this is at the Marriott in Ventura, California. Uh, beautiful hotel, and I've, I've got them out in the carport in the valet parking area. So this way I could pull them far ahead of those that beautiful flora display behind them. And that adds to the depth, and I'm working with my 70 to 200 millimeter again. Some beautiful soft light coming in from camera left, so it adds to a lot of depth and dimension instead of it looking flat. And I just, I'll continue with you just with a couple of images that I want to share, just something very simple. Uh, I'm not going into posing or anything like that tonight. I just want to share some simple thoughts with composition and lighting. But you'll see how I can work through and, and change the, the feeling of, of the photographs here, keeping my portraits going sort of quickly so that I can get inside and shoot some other elements, shoot some of the beauty of the hotel. You know, and I, I just love the idea of when they're looking at each other and talking to each other, that you get the power of the emotion from their eyes. And you'll see how each one of them has been framed with the other person shooting over their shoulder. Sort of a technique from television. And, uh, not that I want to take you away from Carrie's Photography Schoolhouse or any of my webinars or uh, seminars that I teach, but you know, TV is a wonderful way of learning. If you look at some of the quality shows that are on TV, they're photographed so magnificently, and the conversations that always cut back and forth in a conversation lead to this type of, of composition. But what I really enjoy doing, and... Uh, I just I really enjoy showing depth and dimension. Here I am in this hotel. 
the beautiful blue chandelier up there, a little funky, kind of caught my eye, and I thought, look at all these lines. I've got created a triangle with the roof right above me, a little circle with the other area that has the hi-hat lights in it, some nice, uh, some nice area for him to stand and lean on. And there's a couple of f-stops different, difference from where he's standing to the light and to the rest of the lobby here. What I did uh, immediately to my right, about 45 degrees over, I have uh, an assistant holding a flash, and that flash is a, a Lumidine strobe, something a little bit more powerful than uh, sometimes our speed lights, and it's bouncing into an umbrella, which is kind of softly illuminating him. So we've got some shadows. If you look at his face, we've got a highlight side and a shadow side, and I've got a little balance of him. I've got him leaning nicely on this on this edge of the wall and it's balanced with that chandelier that's behind him. And then I just, of course, brought the bride in, changed the direction of light, but wanted to keep it the same way, and we see some beautiful light on the bride's face here. So a nice kind of casual hangout portrait of the two of them using some of the beauty of the lobby. I was able to walk around and find a mirror, so I'm photographing them in the mirror. I've got the light uh, just simply coming toward them, not necessarily uh, illuminating that wall, so the only light that's illuminating that, illuminating that wall is the light provided by the hotel. And you'll see just kind of a, a cool, funky thing. So I know in my eyes, being kind of old school, photographing for 36 years, I enjoy finding my textures actually on the wall rather than you know, bringing them into Photoshop or working with a lot of actions. And not that I won't dress this up or play with it a little bit, but I want to challenge myself to find things photographic. You know, shooting through across the lobby, 200 millimeter away, shooting through that chandelier, giving a little different flavor, backlighting them so that they would stand out. Or as we were coming down the stairs, illuminating them with that same umbrella so that it's off-camera axis, it's to camera right. And I'm able to play with the beautiful skylights of this, uh, this well-lit hotel. And... You know, I just kind of never stopped looking. I like to explore, and I found a few of these umbrellas out back. There was a, a beautiful area to sit down and relax and enjoy the grounds. And as I was walking out there, I started tilting all the umbrellas so I could see a little bit more of the face and the color. And I had my bride and groom in shade. And to me, one of the more important things, as I discussed with you earlier, is keeping them very comfortable, keeping their eyes wide open, keeping them from perspiring, keeping them excited. They're you know, we're having fun, we're having a good time, and I'm shooting in, I'm creating light on their faces in this case with that same flash, that Lumidine that's bouncing into an umbrella to camera left here. And it creates that beautiful light pattern kind of narrowing down the bride's face. You see as I kind of take the attention away from her ear and cheek uh, by simply driving your attention to the plate of her face. So I'm doing that by an off-camera light, off to the side, off to the left side, and then making sure to have my exposure balanced so that I'm exposing correctly for the background as well as the light falling on the bride and groom. And I, I just move around looking for different locations, looking for different backgrounds, you know, having some fun with them, getting them giggling, keeping that light consistent because I want to illuminate both their faces and have light in both of their eyes to see how strong that looks. And then in this case, just working with my long lens, compressing, and exposing for the background. So the previous image where I was shooting into the umbrellas, I was photographing somewhere about 180 millimeter, 180 of a second, and I believe f16. And now I've knocked the power down of the flash and my exposure down so that I could expose for the water falling in the background, which you can see is an open shade. So I've changed my exposure down to I believe about a 50th of a second here. So it's always just figuring out what the exposure is for the background, balancing it with enough flash in the foreground to have some beautiful dimensional photographs. You know, I, I moved him out of the way for a second, did one of her, and then brought him back in and just kind of changed things, keeping things a little bit more formal. But I'm, as you'll see, there's a little kicker light going on there. His, the edge of his, his arm, his shoulders, they both have a little bit of hair light going on. And that really is by just working with them at the edge of the sun, but actually keeping them in shade. And then softly from camera right now, I'm adding that flash to illuminate their face and 
work right across her gown so that you can see all the beautiful work on the, on the bodice of her dress there. And of course, yes, I had to go back and play with the umbrellas from the other side. And what I found is that the sun, this is late in the afternoon, the sun was actually bouncing off the building, throwing light into this side of the umbrellas. This is actually the backlit side. But yet, I'm able to work with bounce light coming off the building, softly illuminating their faces. So I tend to go out looking for light. If I can't find it, I create the light. And what I want to leave you with is I want you to balance the light. So just playing with a couple of different thoughts and expressions and little kisses on noses, little different ideas to play with your, your clients. But what I'm doing is making sure that they're far enough away from the background so that the background is just that. It's a background. I know a lot of folks stand there, people right up against the wall, right up against the background. And they think, they, I know they, they ask me questions when I have the beauty of teaching them. Why don't I have that depth and dimension? And it's because that wall is immediately behind them. So whatever we're doing, I'm, I'm looking to show shallow depth of field. I photographed this at a 320th of a second. I'm sorry, at, at 2.8. And I believe it was a 320th of a second. But just a very shallow depth of field here as they were walking up the stairs. You know, we have white balance to work with. We have all types of light levels to work with. In this case, it was a kind of plain sunset. And I chose to make an exposure of them standing under a tungsten light. And I set my white balance for tungsten, which turned the entire scene blue. But it gave it a little bit of romantic feeling. You know, it was, it was twilight, and I took advantage of that. And as we're in the twilight category here, what I have going on, I've got the two of them just kind of positioned in between a building here, shooting from the balcony area of the Bellagio. Coincidentally, planted Hollywood in the background where they had their first date. Uh, but what I've done is I've added an umbrella here, so I've got a very soft light as uh, we just have a little twilight image that I can mix into the story. So I'm playing with light, trying to keep things in key and in character, never trying or always reminding myself to keep that light as soft as possible on their skin, kind of mimicking window light like I have here, and then I just balance for the background. Uh, the techniques that I'm, I'm sharing with you here are something that I use regardless of the subject matter. And tonight's subject matter, as we've spoken, is about brides and grooms and photographing people. So here, you know, just studying the bride, she's illuminated by window light. And I want to kind of talk to you about a, a term called stacking. You'll see there's two subject matters here. It's the bride kind of fixing herself, putting the ear, her earring on, and just over her shoulder, the maid of honor being finished by the, uh, the hairdresser. So I'm always looking to incorporate sort of uh, storytelling images, you know, storytelling elements, sort of Rockwell-ish here, uh, working in, in Chris's bedroom with just the, the soft light of a, a fan uh, light that's just above where he's sitting, and there's another light, as you'll see, behind the best man as he's dressing, but a relatively low light level here. But just kind of being present and watching as that moment unfurls itself, you know, where we see everybody doing something, and I can just be a fly on the wall. But I look into, again, exemplifying depth and dimension, and you can see here that photographs are really important to this man. So I wanted to make sure to include that, kind of turn a, away for a quick second and photograph him in the mirror, as well as kind of like when that bride was just tuning her earring and that maid of honor in the background. Now you'll see here the best man and the groom, or the best man helping the groom dress, very soft light, but having that second layer in the background of the, uh, the other groomsmen just fixing himself. So as you look through photographs, if you don't have an interesting background, people want to move on kind of quickly. If you can, kind of exemplify it this way, we've got a couple of different subject matters and your eye wants to wander all around the photograph. And it keeps people interested and involved. Just like with this subtle soft uh, first dance picture. You know, it's just a beautiful moment between the two of them, working with no flash here, 3200 ISO on my Canon 1D Mark III. And what I'm doing is I've got myself up on the dance floor against the wall shooting into the guests. 
Now, I'd rather the guests be the background and have depth and dimension and these people be able to recognize their loved ones than just photograph into a, a shallow blank wall. So working with shallow depth of field, working at six, in this case 6400 ISO here, uh, you'll see a buddy of mine in the back is my second shooter. He's shooting with flash and I'm working around without flash, just photographing and in this case I wanted to concentrate on the mom. And I, I feel bad that moms are sitting in the pews as dad walks the bride up the aisle because moms of course have such a, a big part in upbringing. So I'd love to be able to bounce around and, and create images like this from her perspective. But as, as I'm going to wind this down, what I'd, I'd like to share with you is that the background is a background. In this case another beautiful infrared image and the sunlight striking the bride's face, her eyes closed. In this case I chose to cover her with her, her veil. But letting the depth and dimension be present, you know, having a foreground, having a background, matching where the sun is or where the light's coming from, and making sure that the bride's face is illuminated. You know, in this case, you'll see these are the last rays of light as they were filtering through the tree. But you know, we do have control, and I, I love the idea of shooting into her cheek here. You'll see this just with sunlight, and that her cheek is darker, so that we look at the to highlight the plate of her face. I wanted this to be a wide scene to see the top of this beautiful old church and the spectacular clouds, those cumulus clouds coming through and, and what infrared does to it all. But I needed to, for them to be just as bright as the background. And sometimes when we're not able to, we have to do a little bit more. Uh, and with that, I have this image up here to suggest to you to start with the background first. I try to find an image that moves me or a light situation like this, you know, the leaves you'll see framing the church and the storm moving in, these beautiful clouds, so that when I did get to work with the bride and the groom, in this case here, the light had changed on the ground. The previous image that I had was illuminated purely by the sun, and it was, as I mentioned, going down. So now there's no sun in the foreground here, but I didn't want to have to stop photographing because I wanted to include those leaves at the top. And what I did was I, I just worked with a flash off camera. So even though it's infrared, I can still add flash to make sure that I balance the subjects with the background. And what's happening? Oh, I wanted to show you and just leave this on in terms of where our industry is headed. Um, you know, one of the things that we're dealing with is kind of looking into the future. And, and that's certainly what this image is about when I was photographing at the Bellagio. I set up a camera to do time lapse, and I'm incorporating both time lapse and video into my still coverage to make a multimedia presentation to set myself apart from my peers. Uh, the idea of shoot and burn, the idea of giving the client every image that you shoot and then tucking it in a drawer because they have no idea what to do with it has, has been killing me. I was brought up in this craft and. I'd like to think of myself as a craftsman. I design albums and I tell stories with photographs. And using today's technology, I want to use some of the contemporary elements to make it visually interesting for my viewers. So a lot of times I'll structure or leave a camera sitting. I'll start it when they start to design the room and I'll go off and photograph the bride getting dressed or the bride and groom seeing each other or the portraits while this is all taking place. And this is something that what you're looking at here is taking place over a, an hour and a half period. And working with an intervalometer, I'm capturing a frame every two or three seconds and assembling it later on. 